about five years ago, I was 22, I had actually just graduated from Barnard College, and I wanted to be a writer. And among these Lily Coppell, a young writer for the New York Times, found an old diary from the 1930s in a steamer trunk in a dumpster outside of a building. This is that story. The story of the Red Leather Diary. Hi, my name is Lily Coppell, and I'm sitting here with Florence Wolfson Howitt, who's going to turn 93 this August. Oh, and we're God. really connected over this really serendipitous chain of events, which is that one morning I came out of my building on 82nd Street in Riverside Drive. There was a dumpster full of old steamer trunks plastered with their vintage labels from Paris and London and Monaco. And for some reason, as a 22-year-old, I felt drawn to this virtual urban shipwreck. And I climbed in, and I started excavating these old trunks. And there were old flapper dresses, a gorgeous old coat from Bergdorf's, and this crumbling red leather diary kept by a young woman named Florence Wolfson from 1929 to 1934 between the ages of 14 and 19 years old. I tracked her down with the help of a private investigator and reunited her with her book. And it's really changed lives, both of ours and I believe anybody who comes in contact with this story, which is really about finding the significance of all of our lives and their private truths. What can I say to that except that it happened to me, so I feel like a character in a fairy tale and something not real. To have a friend named Lily Couple who was young and beautiful, to have people no longer regard me as an old relic is the, it's, it's heaven. What can I say? So thank you, sweetheart. Well, you actually have compared yourself before to almost that you felt like you were an old relic, like this old book. And somehow you felt that your life has been reinvigorated. Not that it wasn't already an incredible life, because I, no. I wanted so badly to find you, because you had filled the diary's pages with just your search for love and your love of literature and yeah. music and art. But I tell you, sweetheart, I ran out of energy uh, when I got to be 80 because I had uh, all kinds of things done to me, like hip replacements and, and eye stuff. In my mind, I never ran out of energy, but you have to have the body to do things with. So I quit playing tennis and I quit a lot of things that I used to do. And I really felt inside myself that I was just a vegetable. And when you came along and showed me what I was, some of that passion and energy, which I had put behind me, bubbled up. I could just feel it bubbling up inside me. It was, it was wonderful. And people responded to that. And I have never in my whole life, including my prime, gotten so many compliments. I guess one of the advantages of being an old lady, and if you don't look that old, everybody is impressed. So everybody is impressed that I feel wonderful. good. You look wonderful. Remember, one of the first questions you asked me was, what did you think I would look like? And I said, well, I knew you were gorgeous, because <laughs> in your diary was this old newspaper clipping with your face, this marcelled hair, these big, longing, intelligent eyes. And one of the most unusual things about me getting to know you as a teenager and then meeting you at 90 is I sit next to you and I see you as, as, as young, intense Florence. How did I have the ego to let those intimate words be made public? That is something that I have been asked. And I must tell you, it bothers me a little bit. I've never been embarrassed or ashamed of mm -hmm. anything in that book because my intent was always the best. Well, I had a choice between making it public or going on living my relic life. So I decided I don't want to be a relic anymore. I decided the hell with it.
But you know what? What was so interesting was just how adventurous you were as a young woman growing up in 1930s Manhattan. You were at the theater constantly. New York in those days was as safe as any small town. Mm -hmm. There was no problem. You just went where you wanted to go. But how about going to the theater, going to see Eva Le Gallien, the avant-garde stage actress who you were obsessed with or yeah. in love yeah. with? Yeah, yeah. I did have a crush on I her. I mean, no you lived about with it. incredible independence as a young woman. Well, that's one of the uh, advantages of having parents who are not taking care of you. I was on my own, and I could do what I want pretty well. My father was busy, my mother was busy. We always had a housekeeper. I don't understand my parents who were simple Jewish immigrants how they let their daughter go to theater alone at night and come back on the subway. And well, that's unheard of today. Well, Florence, when you were writing in the diary, what did you envision your life would be like? I mean, art I, was very important to I you. I felt I was going to be a painter, mm -hmm. a painter or a playwright, mm -hmm. one of the two, definitely. I never thought of having children. I just thought of living a very exciting, glamorous, art-filled mm -hmm. life, which it didn't turn out to be. I'm not a mainstream, middle-class female. I never felt that I was. About the business with women, to me, a beautiful person is a beautiful person, whether it's a male or female, always was. So I wasn't really worried about that. In fact, I enjoyed it. You wrote the foreword to the book, and what I think really makes you, to me, still that young woman of the diary is just how you said, go for it. I mean, these were very personal, your innermost thoughts from 14 to 19. Mm. They were your adventures in art and in love. There were affairs with both men and women. I mean, you in many ways, you were totally ahead of your time. No question about that, yeah. I, well, I never fit in. I mean, that was one of the tragedies of my young life, that I never really fit into the regular pattern. I didn't make a sorority at Hunter. Mm -hmm. I was always regarded as... Uh, no great loss, but you were yeah, independent. You're right. Yes, yes. And I'm the only woman I know who, when she had children in those days, wore sneakers and jeans when she took her children to the park. All the other women on Riverside Drive got dressed up in their beautiful tailored suits and pumps, and I come along in denims. I didn't even know they existed in, in those days. I mean, it's hard to believe, Dungarees. isn't it? This was right. a long time ago, mm -hmm. 60, 65 years ago. What did it feel like, though, writing again, in writing the foreword? Well, when you first asked me to do it, I was, oh, no, no, I can't do it. And I thought, why not try it? And I got, oh, it was heaven. I sat there and tried to marshal my thoughts and wrote and then sent it to Valerie to uh, print so Your she daughter. could send it back. That's because I didn't have a word processor. And finally did it. And then I thought it was pretty good. And I can't tell you how wonderful I felt. So I advise anybody who is getting on and who feels that life isn't so exciting, do something on your own. Express yourself some way. You know, be, be alive. Be more than just a spectator or a card player, or even though I play bridge. What are the similarities you see between yourself now and then? Oh, the way I scoff at lots of stuff, at, at standard values. I did then and I still do today. And I'm amazed that the women I know, some of whom are so square, have read the book and don't even talk about the... Uh, Love affairs the with women's women. Love, yeah, yeah, because I've heard them say years ago, oh, I couldn't stand that kind of thing. I, I, uh, I despise it. But they don't. But you always seem like you're on a quest to understand yourself 
yeah. more. Yeah. As you were writing in the diary, yeah. you were really yeah. reflecting on who you were. In a way, you were creating your life, and your life was this adventure. And I find that you again have really invited chance and change into your life today by saying, like you write in the diary, you had some hesitations about laying out these personal thoughts for the world to see, but you thought your younger self would have said, go for yeah, it. Yeah, because life was pretty, yeah. I was happy being whatever it is that I was, asking questions and going my way and doing what I wanted to do. I guess I've always been different from the women I'm surrounded by, and they all are aware of it, and they are all very, now, much more impressed with me than they were before. I hate to tell you this, but even old women are snotty, and... So it's yeah. like mean girls. Yeah, yeah. With those stupid bourgeois, moral values, which I, I don't buy into and never have. So what do you think distinguishes you from the group? Or if you're at a bridge table or in your home in Florida and you have friends over? What distinguishes me is what goes on in my mind. All I can say is that this has been the most fun I think that any 92-year-old woman can have. How do other people see you? Well, they see me not, I'm not a regular old lady anymore. And even my daughters and my granddaughters treat me with more respect. They think I'm cool. <laughs> Is that fabulous? A cool 92 year old. What could be better? <laughs> So, Florence, you said you were going to put on a blonde wig. Well, how do you like it? You never cease to amaze me. It looks <laughs> great. Thank you. You look I like love... a movie star. At least. I mean, describe this coat you used to wear, the velvet coat with the... A, a white fox collar. Mm-hmm. Elegant, gorgeous. And I had a, uh, a gray suit with a black velvet collar. My husband loved it. I had it for years and years and years and years. My husband was somebody I met when I was 13 years old. He was only 18, but he was so competent, so reliable, so honest. As a human being, I don't think I have ever met another human being with his integrity and his values, which were really humane and moral and just wonderful. You told me about, <laughs> you met him at Spring Lake. At Spring Lake, Which yeah. was the hotel his parents owned in the Catskills. Yeah, and my mother knew his father back in Russia. Okay, so let, we're going to read. January, to start at the top. January 16th, 1930. I can't believe I was alive then. Makes me feel antediluvian. I bought a pair of patent leather opera pumps with real high heels. April 8th, 1930. Bought myself a little straw hat, 345. Can you believe that? I can't believe that. It Maybe won't it was last long. $345. April 20th, 1931. Oh, dyed my eyebrows and eyelashes, and I've absolutely ruined my face. March 13th, 1934. A fashion show for amusement and almost overcome with envy. Not for the clothes, but for the tall, slim loveliness of the models. You were about 15 in some of the entries, 15, 16, 17. Oh. June 28, 1932, have stuffed myself with Mozart and Beethoven. I feel like a ripe apricot. I'm dizzy with the exotic. February 21st, 1931. Went to the Museum of Modern Art and almost passed out from sheer jealousy. I can't even paint an apple yet. It's heartbreaking. July 3rd, 1932. 
five hours of tennis and glorious happiness. All I want is someone to love. I feel incomplete. Is that crazy for a 15-year-old girl to say? This was written when I was 15. There's so much to do. Music, art, books, people. Can one absorb it all? Is it still true? I guess it is. But a lot of people don't take advantage of it. I think staying true to something like this, about just how much there is the, for the world to still offer, rings true for all ages. And I think that's right. why you and I relate to each other For any so age, well. that's the beauty of music and art and books, that inside in your mind you never have to grow old. Never.